Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. We're delighted to have you here today to talk about the future of Britain and, and the Commonwealth. I think we're all watching uh, Britain very closely following the passing of Queen Elizabeth and the succession of Prince Charles. But now King Charles. Um, and here to talk about it, I can think of two no better people than uh, Robert D. Kaplan, uh, FBRI's chair in geopolitics, Robert strauss a chair in geopolitics, and our newest fellow, Dominic Green. I also want to mention topics uh, particularly interesting because uh, our Orbis editor and I, Nick Gavazdev, spent a couple days on the HMS Queen Elizabeth as part of the Atlantic Futures Forum sponsored by uh, the British government, talking about international security and the future, including the future of our alliance. Um, so uh, Robert E. Kaplan, uh, you all know him. Uh, he is, as I mentioned, the Robert strauss Pay Chair in Geopolitics for FBRI. He's also the best-selling author of 21 books. Is that right, Bob? 21, yes. including yes. Adriatic, his latest, which is up on my shelf here, as well as the coming, uh, The Tragic Mind, which is coming in a few months. Um, we, Dominic Green, as I mentioned, is our newest senior fellow uh, in our Center for the Study of America and the West. He's a historian, a columnist, and a critic. He's the author of The Double Life of Dr. Lopez, Spy Shakespeare, and the Plot to Poison Queen Elizabeth. He's also a regular contributor of op-eds and reviews in major publications, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Examiner, and the Jewish Chronicle. He also writes daily. He also writes regularly for the Daily Telegram, the New Criterion, and the New York Post. He was also previously uh, the editor in chief of the Spectator's U.S. edition. Uh, before I turn the floor over, I would like to put in a plug for a couple of um, uh, upcoming events we have. Um, and one of them is October 18th from 10 to 11 a.m. Um, that is trade and politics in East Asia. Uh, China and Taiwan apply the CPTPP while the U.S. stays out. Uh, be looking at the geopolitics or geo, geopolitics and geoeconomics of China. Uh, the other event I want to put in a plug for is our upcoming um, uh, Templeton Lecture on World Affairs and Religion. And this year we're going to be talking about the Ukrainian Orthodox and Greek Catholic churches in resistant F resistance efforts in the war against Russia. And uh, Heather Craig, uh, who is a professor at the Army War College, will be giving that lecture this year. And before I turn the floor over to our um, to our speakers today, I'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors uh, for uh, all you do to support us. We couldn't do it without you. Um, and also a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we pr prefer them in the Q&A box because if you put them in the chat, we sometimes miss them. So without further ado, I'll hand the reins over to Bob Kaplan. Well, thank you, Raleigh. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially with Dominic Green, whose most recent book is The Religious Revolution. It's a history of the 19th century. All you want to know about Charles Darwin, Theodore Herzl, um, uh, uh, John Ruskin, Richard Wagner, and many other uh, uh, notable philosophical and, and, and artistic giants. Um, I'm going to get right into it, Dominic. Britain now has a new king, Charles III, and a relatively new prime minister, Liz Truss. This all happened within a few days of each other, actually. Um, you know, decades can go by, as Lenin said, and nothing happens. And then days and weeks go by and decades happen. So I think we're in that phase in Great Britain, you know, you know, especially though the economic news is shattering. I want to start you off talking about the royal family. And my question would be this. Let me tee this up. Queen Elizabeth reigned for 70 years and she never embarrassed herself, you know, you know essentially. Charles, the new king, spent many years 
effectively embarrassing himself. Um, how is this going to work? Can Charles um, have a new image as a king? And will he be, for reasons of age, a transitional figure? And William, Prince William, is the person we should really be focused on. Take it away. Well, uh, firstly, thank you, Raleigh, Robert. It, it's, it's a great honor to be doing this. And you both said such wonderful things. It's going to be downhill from here all the way, as indeed it may well be for uh, Britain's economy and monarchy on, on the current form. Um, well, it's very true. Elizabeth II was uh, an extraordinarily uh, long lived and also uh, skillful manager. Uh, of the business of monarchy. And I think she may have raised everybody's expectations to an almost unfair level, because if you take the longer view, you will see that most of the people who have sat on the English or British throne were thoroughly undeserving, except for reasons of birth, and frequently lacking in any kind of professional merit. Um, that said, uh, most of them did not operate under intense uh, media scrutiny, and most of them did not hurry even to make themselves uh, understood through the media. Uh, if the modern monarchy, the one which is really in a sort of fatal dance uh, with media, if you can be traced to begin in the reign of George V, who instituted, for instance, the Christmas Day radio speech and all these other theatricals, um, there is no, at no point except in the post-royal career of Princess Diana has there been an instance where uh, someone has courted public attention and, and brought their opinions forward uh, as assiduously as Charles III had in, in the long decades when he was in rehearsal. And, and now uh, he's actually in the spotlight. Um, you get the feeling uh, that he hasn't finished and, and that he's going to continue uh, offering us his opinions. And unfortunately, his opinions are those uh, undistinguishable uh, and undistinguished and indistinguishable from those of the average reader of the guardian uh, and and the one thing that uh, the people of britain look for in a monarchy is a symbol um, if they want lectures on the environment or, or many other worthy things such as being nice to each other and avoiding polluting the rivers and restoring the hedgerows and other urgent uh, subjects, then of course that there are plenty of other uh, outlets and voices who are actually quite professional about it. Um, it's a very dangerous thing because uh, at least since 1688, the understanding has been that you get to keep the land and you keep the palaces, but uh, sovereignty is in the parliament. Um all right, um, take, taking this, um, I noticed that Charles is a real um, Islamophile. He reads a lot about Islamic history, Islamic culture, and um, he's also an aficionado of Romania. I believe he owns a, an estate in Transylvania. Um, how will this play out? Because you could see it being positive on one hand, you know, a very cultured, worldly, cosmopolitan king who says smart statements every once in a while and, and brings the monarchy to the elite? Or could it be where he will essentially have opinions on the Middle East and on Eastern Europe and things which could create a constitutional crisis? So far, since he's been uh, since he's um, arisen to be king, we don't know yet because he hasn't said much yet, at least I haven't followed it. But could this go both ways? Of course, he will be a different kind of a monarch than Queen Elizabeth, who essentially had the brilliance of having no public opinions on anything. Yes, and I think you're right. This is the difference between words and deeds. And that is also the difference between political acts and uh, political symbols. Um, the king is a symbol. Uh, he's not an actor. He's only required to sign off on certain things. Um, he's certainly not required to drive policy. The late queen said, I have to be seen to be believed. Uh, and being seen is what makes them most credible. Uh, pictures of King Charles with religious leaders from all the different faith traditions can only have a very positive impact because that makes people think about what religions share in common. Uh, words and acts in which Prince Charles emphasizes points of political difference, for instance, talking about Eastern Europe, talking about the Middle East, this can only aggravate 
at least half of his audience, if not more, because even if half of his audience agrees with him, they don't want to hear it coming from him. So he will have, unfortunately, to change a lifetime of holding forth and, and do his best to remain silent. Uh, and he could be king for quite a while. Um, getting out the actuarial list, um, he is one of the oldest monarchs, I believe, to have become king of Britain, but he's in pretty good shape. He's certainly in better shape than Edward VII, who also had a very long wait uh, and uh, lasted only nine years, but he was extremely unhealthy. So it's quite possible that um, this will be more than an interregnum between the old queen and her seven decades, and then the what I call the Marks and Spencer monarchy, the very modern English middle class monarchy that William and Kate will represent. So it, it could be 15 or 20 years of, of Charles, and, and I don't believe he will be able to keep quiet for that long. I don't believe he'll be able to keep quiet for the end of the month. Yeah. Do we know much about William? Has, you know, I mean, what do we know about him? Because we, we see his face, his picture. You know, he has a very, you know, him and his wife look very stately very proper, kind of perfect for the job. But what do we know about them? Almost nothing at all. We Obviously, we know about her before she became royal. Uh, and we know about him in terms of, of what has been, uh, we've been allowed to know or what has leaked out from his occasional brushes with normal life, for instance, when he was a schoolboy and a student or when he was serving in the Royal Air Force. But we know very little about them. And this is how it should be. I mean, Walter Badgett in the 19th century advised against, you know, don't let the light in on the magic. Uh, keep it vague. Uh, the royal family are meant to be a symbolic repository uh, for people's ideal version of what a political system or a society could represent. The last thing we want to know is, is the ordinary human petty details. Um, switching over to the politics now, um, it seemed that Liz Truss became prime minister, uh, Queen Elizabeth died, and within days after that, the spotlight shifted from the monarchy to, the, uh, to 10 Downing Street. And it seems based on the markets uh, um, to, to have been a disastrous beginning. Um, it, was it disastrous? Was it disastrous because of politics, but it was really the right thing to do? Um, you know, her, her new tax program, or was it disastrous overall? You know, being Thatcherite at a time, you know, in, in, in 2022 doesn't, may not work to being Thatcherite in 1979, 1980. Yes, I, I think the, the secret in politics, as in comedy, is, is timing. And, and the timing is such, I can't recall an instance where you have a new monarch and a new prime minister within, I think, 72 hours. And nor can I recall a period in modern British history where you've had, as we've now had, four prime ministers in the space of six years. Um, I, I Perhaps during the, the 1780s, uh, there was a quick turnover. At one point, they had trouble finding someone to fill Lord North's chair after the, the American Revolution had, had gone so wrong for him. Um, in other words, this is almost unprecedented, certainly in modern times. Um, and a lot of it is, of course, accidental. Um, the markets are, are generally spooked at the moment, and any sign of, of uncertainty, anything which indicates a lack of sense or control, they will respond as they did. One thing that wasn't perhaps emphasized enough is the degree to which the strong dollar uh, it, it exaggerated the effect of this uncertainty because the euro declined relative to the dollar by the same degree as the pound did. Uh, the difference being that uh, people have long given up on their expectations of the euro and it had already dipped below uh, the crucial psychological barrier of parity with the dollar. And the pound was, by the Bank of England's intervention, just about saved. And I think it, it fell down to a uh, dollar three and has, then went pretty much back up. And again, that recovery wasn't emphasized. And, in, and then again, it, in recent days, it has now gone below a dollar ten because there remains serious skepticism, uh, not just about the trust uh, program, but also about the way in which uh, the Bank of England is operating, which is independent of the government. Uh, it's, it's been noted that, in effect, uh, fiscal policy is pulling against monetary policy. 
the government's fiscal policy is to stimulate growth by cutting taxes. The Bank of England's monetary policy is to get inflation down. And therefore, it doesn't want to intervene more than necessary. And it wants to slow things. It wants to slow growth, in fact, because that's a reliable way of getting it down. And the result is that the Bank of England intervened, said it wouldn't, the pound fell further. And so far, there is no resolution of, the, of who is driving. At the moment, the British economy, or the management of it, looks like the push me pull you in Dr. Doolittle. And of course, the markets hate uncertainty. And this is a sustained public demonstration of uncertainty, and it throws uh, serious questions upon the competence of both parties in, in the way that they are pulling against each other. So yes, the timing was um, most unfortunate, uh, but it's carelessness uh, for this to be dragging out. And the trust uh, government has yet to explain how it's going to fund the system, having made all these tax cuts. It's partially reversed. Uh, the most controversial uh, announcement, which was uh, reducing the top rate of income tax. Um, I believe at the end of October, they're going to announce this. And I have no doubt when they do announce it, that there'll be a further run on the pound because there is a serious credibility problem here. And again, part of it is timing, but there, there is two kinds of timing here. One of them is the way in which trust came to power. Uh, the other is the medium term fact that the Conservatives have been in power now for uh, they're in their 13th year. Uh, the great cycles of government uh, since Mrs. Thatcher came in in 1979 have been about that long. The Conservatives were in uh, for 15, 16 years, and then Labour came in for 13, 14 years. And now the Conservatives are reaching a similar cycle's end. And you can see that the barrel is being, is being scraped. And this is not a government of all the talents. This is a government of the, with those willing to take up a poisoned chalice. They have two years in which to fix it in enormous headwinds uh, because what, the global economy is not favorable. How do you rate her cabinet and how do you rate her as a leader? She certainly started out badly. Can she learn? I mean, or is she just, a, you know, you know, the ordinary person who is willing to take the job? And, you know, and then there are other members in the cabinet, too. Are they seen as professional technocrats or what? Some members of the cabinet have, have previous experience at that level, but a lot of them are first timers, which means that they will spend the next few months trying to understand how to negotiate with the civil servants who are charged with coming up with information and implementing their ideas. So it's very difficult for first timers to do anything drastic. Uh, as a leader, I, I have to say that uh, Lynn Truss lacks what for me seems to be one of the most, for good or bad, the essential accoutrement of modern leadership, which is charisma. She doesn't come across well on the screen. She doesn't come across well when she gives a speech. Um, her history is one of um, either rapid development or, or unscrupulous opportunism, depending on how you look at it. Uh, she has Attacked one way or the other. She was against Brexit in 2016, but then for it now and shortly afterwards. Um, it's not really clear politically what she has stood for other than the preservation of power. But then you could probably say that about the Conservative Party in general at the moment, because it is committed to two completely contradictory uh, impulses. And it's not entirely the party's fault. The reason is that the Brexit vote of 2016 achieved a majority because it formed a coalition between two irreconcilable factions in a way. The faction of the city of London, globalization, open borders for skilled immigration, and the very large number of working class and lower middle class people in the provinces who hate London, are opposed to globalization, see it as economically damaging to their interests, and are strongly against any kind of immigration, skilled or not. And this coalition in a referendum, of course, can produce a yes vote. But as we know, governing, governing by referenda is not possible precisely because of the unstable nature of a coalition of that kind. Now, Boris Johnson bridged that gap by his uh, tremendous charisma and also by a promise to uh, level up the regions, to in, in fact make life better for the people outside London while 
continuing with the development of what some call Singapore on Thames, which is London as, as we now know it, in effect. Uh, but those are two very difficult uh, constituencies to reconcile, if they can be reconciled by policy. And it's not clear that Lynn Truss or anyone in her cabinet has the faintest idea where to start doing it. Can Boris Johnson come back and what would be the scenario for that to happen? And what does that say about British politics? He can come back. I personally uh, would bet on it. I'm not sure when. If the wheels come off very, very badly, and it's quite possible because you know the economic headwinds are such and the lack of credibility in the government is such, uh, it could be before the next election, which has to be before January 2025. Uh, if he doesn't come back then, then the Conservatives will go into opposition, which will be very good for them. And again, I would imagine him returning quite successfully after that, five years later. Um, in other words, crisis or defeat has to occur. Uh, and that really reflects the, the extreme uh, nature of the situation that Britain finds itself in. Uh, and part, not all of it is, is of its own making. Some of it is universal. Uh, it's not as if things are going better across the English Channel. The European Union has its own crisis, including a, a crisis of legitimacy, which is much more extensive than the one in Britain. Um, but Britain has uh, to make a go of it on its own. And it's not clear exactly how you can make those steps in, in these circumstances. So I suspect things will get worse before they get better. Has there been a comparative time in British history to compare to this? Is this well, pretty unique? Well, I, I'm one of uh, Thatcher's children, as they're called. And um, I do remember my, my 70s childhood. Uh, so I do remember a time of uh, energy rationing, which we've been told will not be happening in Britain this winter compared, say, to France or Germany. Uh, I do remember a time when the railways didn't work because the unions had shut them down, which is the sort of thing that now happens again in Britain. Um, and I also do remember it as a time of, of enormous social tensions and hostilities, which is also uh, an issue in Britain. The big question, as, as you're referring to earlier, is whether the, the Thatcherite medicine, which rather forcibly forced Britain out of that 70s rut, whether that really applies now. And one question I, I, I ask myself about it is... I don't think that Britain is in exactly the same state of mind as it was in the 70s either. This imperial hangover, which seemed very much to be a, a part of the 70s problem, has, has gone. Um, people will say, will say that, oh, Brexit is empire nostalgia. I've never met anybody who, who would seriously argue that. In fact, it seems to be the antidote, really. Um, so... I, I don't think that that applies. And I, I also don't think that the kind of economy which we're trying to fix applies either, because Britain is not a majority working class industrial economy, as it thought it should be in the 1970s. It is now a majority middle class property owning services based economy. So the nature of the challenge is different as well. The services based economy is in especially financial services uh, is enormously sensitive to global fluctuations in the way that an economy which is based on your industrial production is not. Um, and, and that gives less room for maneuver to a government which is trying to give a dose of the Thatcherite tough love. What and, is the, Dominic, what is the basis of British power at this moment in the world? I mean, it doesn't have an empire, that's gone. Uh, it does have nuclear weapons. It has a very capable, but very, rather small military. Um, it has an advantageous geographical position, sort of part of Europe, but yet not part of Europe is sort of like combine an Atlantic, you know, an Atlantic uh, country with sort of like a bridge between the US and Europe. If you look at all of those inheritances, none of which, of course, are the creation of any recent government, um, if you look at all those inheritances, that is a tremendous set of advantages which a, a competent and, and forward-seeing uh, government could well pull together to create a very solid second-tier status in what is now a multipolar world, uh, a world in which small or relatively small powers can prosper by specializing, for instance, in things like financial services, 
and uh, extensive military operations. These are things that Britain always has specialized in and, and are within its reach to do. But that requires competence. It requires a, a governing competence. And it's not just the people you elect, it's also institutional. And, and to my understanding, uh, the, the civil service in Britain is, is um, paralytically slow and ancient and incompetent. It prides itself on its professionalism, but its professionalism is not, I believe, in tune with the 21st century at all. So making the most of all those assets is going to require, as I'm afraid, what they call a change in mindset. Um, you referred earlier to Singapore on the Thames. Um, isn't, you know, when I think of Singapore, which I've visited many times and wrote often about, Singapore has this sort of dynamism of the overseas Chinese, you, you know, very organized, methodical, hardworking, and politically, you know, you know, socially conservative. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a jewel to behold to go to Singapore and to see them maneuver. I mean, the Singaporean um, for, foreign foreign f foreign ministry, the diplomats there are some of the most ruthless um, analytical thinkers I've ever met. Kind of like the Israelis, you know, in a way. Can Britain do this? I mean, you know, you, you know, that's the question. Well, partly it comes down to national culture. And whenever people ask me about it, I always say, well, spitting is illegal in Singapore. Well, um, you know, Br Britain would be Singapore with spitting, drinking in the street and, and uh, people beating each other up in the evenings. Um, that said, historically, again, Britain has had this enormous dynamism. It's shown, you know, over and over again, a, 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 an ability to send people all over the world and, and make constructive use of what was historically a marginal position. As you said, Britain was utterly marginal to the history of Europe until the great turn to the Atlantic. Um, and the world is still open in that sense. Um, and Britain has these great historical uh, inheritances of relationships, for instance, with India, that as we look at the Eurasian landmass as being once more the center of gravity of human affairs. Britain has lots of um, good inheritances to build on there. So again, it comes down to a matter of culture. Would they be able to do it as, as smoothly as the Singaporeans or as ruthlessly as the Israelis? No, but Britain has, you know, its diplomats too have a long relation for being smooth and ruthless. Uh, it's just a question, I believe, of... Uh, creating a different kind of governing culture. And that, I mean, when we talk about Thatcherism, uh, we tend to talk about uh, taxation and economic arguments and so on. But what Thatcherism also uh, restored in a sense was a sense of uh, the potential of the ordinary middle-class meritocrat, which is when we talk about Victorian Britain and its achievements, we tend to talk about those people not those who've inherited their power or lands or status or all the rest of it. Making Britain a more meritocratic place was one of Thatcher's greatest achievements. Um, there is no shortage of talent. What there is a shortage of is, is leadership and, as I said, institutional competence. And the difficulty in delivering Brexit in the last six years has shown again and again uh, a weakness in leadership and a weakness or, if, or an unreliability in the sense of the institutional competence. Both parties have acted as if they were like those old English cars that when it rained, you wouldn't start them. Uh, the, the engine just turns over, but you're not going anywhere. Um, there's been a great deal of, of bad faith shown by the political leadership and the civil service in rejecting the will of the people who made it very clear and, and, they don't want out of Europe. And I should add that Singapore had the advantage for a long time of being a semi-dictatorship, essentially, which allowed for the real dynamism of the 1970s and 1980s. By the time Singapore really democratized, it was already there. No, you know, well, there's not going to be a semi-dictatorship in Britain. I can, I can think semi-anarchy is perfectly, yeah. perfectly attainable. <laughs> We're well on the way now already. Um, but, but seriously, though, um, it does require uh, a reconciliation between uh, the bubble and the rest, between the political leadership and the people. And this is a similar uh, challenge uh, to one we see existing across uh, the liberal democracies 
obviously in the United States as well. It is maybe baked into the cake of, of, of a democratic capitalist society. You know, Stondahl describes it. It's a staple, isn't it? The, the gap between the city and the country. Um, but it's, it's become uh, unsustainably wide in Britain, even though it's a very small country. Um, and, and if they don't repair that, there will be no fix uh, to the big questions. I mean, the fundamentals, which is really the social contract uh, and the basics of economic credibility, these are the things which have unraveled in the last year or two. Uh, and not just because of international factors, but the mishandling of COVID-19, for instance, uh, lost the government a lot of credibility. Um, these are these fundamentals that have to be fixed before any of these big questions can even be considered. Last question. Um, about the Commonwealth. Does it still matter? Can it be a bridge? Can it be useful for any British government, this or one in the future? I remember, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher had a very low opinion of the Commonwealth. Um, um, where does it stand now? Is it just a symbol? Uh, uh, you know, is it something that Britain could use as a platform in some way? It's interesting because when you say that, it, it reminds us how Thatcher did operate in a sense in a simpler time. There were the, the moral binaries of the Cold War were a very effective framework, even though the Cold War could frequently uh, be, in fact, multipolar. It certainly operated as the American team and the Russian team. So Britain had a very solid place tucked in uh, behind America. And the Commonwealth, therefore, didn't really serve a purpose in the Cold War, not least because its most important component, perhaps India, was in leading the non-aligned movement and leading non-alignment in favor of Russia most of the time. So this is a different era. Uh, the Commonwealth, I, I understand it as uh, to use an image from Thatcher's time, is, is a fantastic Rolodex to have on the desk. It, it's, a, it's a series of connections which do exist, which can be invoked, and which sending someone like Charles III off to say hello and wave the flag in is a very good way of uh, fostering those relationships and turning them into um, economic and uh, military uh, alliances for a different era. Um, again, I, I would list it among these potential platforms for, for development. It's not like Britain is short of these things. It, it's, it's short of leadership and competence. All right, I think we'll turn it over to questions now from the audience. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Great discussion. Uh, we have a question about um, a comment, then a question. Uh, there's growing discontentment with, British, with the British monarchy and the current government made a blunder too soon with tax cuts. What does what does a common British citizen think about their country's position globally? I'm pretty common, so I, I can answer that. Um, <laughs> it, 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 this discontent with the monarchy fluctuates. Um, it reached a peak uh, after the death of Princess Diana when uh, the Queen in particular was perceived as out of touch, but that very quickly reverted to the norm. Um, she was more popular than the institution, it's true. Her ratings were always higher, uh, which is remarkable because if you think about it, it should be the other way around. And this week it probably is. Um, but still, the ratings of the institution remain ridiculously high, uh, 75, 80%. They are the kind of ratings that politicians uh, would die for or kill for. So uh, discontent with the monarchy is a sort of a safety valve, but I don't ever imagine it blowing. Discontent with the political echelon, on the other hand, uh, has blown up more than once. And I think we will probably see civil disorder in Britain quite soon if things continue on this path. It, it, it seems to be the mixture of disconnection and incompetence is, is going to inflame things, particularly as people literally, I mean, everybody I know in Britain is switching off their heating and, and trying to plan for how to pay the bills this winter, which, and, and nobody expected to be back in the winter of 1978 you know, in 2022. So there is a very real um, serious danger, as I said, of disorder and a, and a further breakdown of trust. Um, and, and it's not surprising if it happens, but I think the monarchy in those moments, unless uh, King Charles jumps in and, and makes some foolish political observation, the monarchy then emerges as the last reliable piece of the furniture as the house is going up in flames. So um, I, in, in a way, uh, the, the harder the political situation, the better it might go for the monarchy. Mm. Uh, speaking of energy and the win coming winter, uh, what does the British population feel about uh, Ukraine and, and Britain's role there? This is a very complicated question. 
um, there was a great surge of public support for Ukraine. Um, unlike in uh, the US, public opinion perceives it, Ukraine as being part of the same part of the world. It's the other end of Europe. If, and, and of course, Europe, to the, to the English in particular, is, is you know, not to be trusted. It's always where trouble starts. Uh, on the other hand, you, have, you live with it and it's integral to your economy and security. So there was a great public upsurge of support uh, for Ukraine. The test will come, as it will come in other European publics, as the thermometer drops. Uh, which is now starting to happen. Uh, literally, whether people will feel they can afford to continue uh, a conflict or subsidizing a, a conflict, which will hit them in the, in the pocketbook and will you know, lead people to, to uh, turn off the heat, which sounds extremely material and shallow, but this is uh, you know, how it works. The British government, of course, under Boris Johnson, was, was leading the charge in favor of Ukraine. Liz Truss has made, Liz Truss has made the same noises, but it, you don't have to be you know, Nostradamus to see that there's going, something will have to give if they, they don't have the money to run the country, then spending money on weapons, diverting resources to, to a war in Ukraine, this will become very unpopular. On the other hand, if they're able, as, as Truss has said, and as, as also as Emmanuel Macron has said, if they're able to cap energy prices, and restrict the economic pain, then public support, I, don't, I doubt, will remain high. Um, let me jump in here with a question, if I may. Um, there are two dynamics going on with the Ukraine war. One is the battlefield, which is going in favor of the Ukrainians. The other mm. is the energy hit in Europe in the coming winter. Yeah. And Ross Douthat, a New York Times columnist, um, you know, he opined that if the Ukrainians continue to do as well as they have in the past on the battlefield, governments in Europe like Britain will be able to survive the winter without, without breaking from the cause. Um, but if it's the other way around, in other words, the battlefield will lead the domestic front in Europe. But I'm, I don't know about that. How does it look mm. in Britain? Well, I, I've written it the other way around. I believe that, um, firstly, if the Ukrainians uh, seize the initiative too successfully, they're likely to run beyond the umbrella of Western support, which has made it possible for them to do that. And that will create an unpredictable and uncontrollable dynamic. Secondly, that Western support is ultimately predicated on the support of the electorates in these societies. And their support depends, as we're saying, on the energy battle. So it is very possible, as we're now seeing, that the Ukrainians are making up ground and pushing back uh, Putin's troops. But it's not that that's putting an end point on how far this war can go on. What's putting the end point is the temperature and the price of energy and so on. And I don't think we've seen the last of uh, Putin's non-military measures. Um, and so I, I suspect the October surprise in this case uh, may be that you can win a war on the ground through your proxy and still suffer a kind of democratic defeat among your own population for economic reasons. So I don't think this, this conflict is, is as clear cut now or is likely to end in that way that uh, Ross Duta is saying. Yeah. Raleigh? Uh, uh, Dominic, you haven't talked much about Brexit. And would you care to go there both near term, long term, and implications for the United Kingdom, uh, right. so Northern Ireland, Scotland. Yes. Well, I, I should declare my hand, which is firstly, I was in favor of it, not so much as an idealist, um, but because I thought that it was the historic dynamic of um, British history, or English history in particular, reasserting itself. As I said, Britain's uh, historic position regarding Europe was as an offshore power, a balancer, in fact, of, of power within Europe. That was always the goal, never to have one single power dominating the European continent. Um, later, its historic position was that of a, of a gateway to the world. It was most definitely facing west to the, the Americas, or if it was looking east, it was looking over Europe, towards the Middle East, towards India, towards Asia. It was maritime as opposed to a land power. So for all these reasons, it seemed to me that a sort of natural historical gravity 
was reasserting itself after the end of the Cold War as a classic centralized top-down European you know, state took place, to, developed in Europe as in the way that the European Union is such a clear inheritor of, of all of the autocracies that preceded it from Charlemagne to the Habsburgs. Um, in the same way, Britain restored itself to its natural gravity. And so it seemed to me effectively insupportable once we reached the point, which we had reached, when a trading organization uh, developed by degrees into a political one controlled from Brussels. At that point, it was it was uh, push or, or shove. And so the British naturally had to leave. I, I do think of that as natural. What is unnatural is what has taken place subsequently, which I describe as a, a lack of competence and willingness on the part of the civil service in Britain, which has done its best to uh, reverse things, on the part of substantial parts of the Conservative MPs in Parliament, who, after all, turned over Boris Johnson, who was the person who actually carried the thing over the line, and, and also a lack of goodwill generally from the European Union, which understandably does not want to give the remaining uh, members of the EU any inclination that they are allowed to change course, that they are allowed to uh, claim complete freedom uh, from Brussels again. So all of this has, has made it an agonized process. In, that's the medium term. In the long run, as I said, because of the long run view, I'm sure it'll work out. It took 40 or 50 years for British law to turn into European law. It took 40, 50 years for a civil servant in Britain to succeed or fail professionally as an interpreter of European law. It took the same for the judiciary. The entire apparatus has been trained to think in terms of Brussels' law, and now it has to go back to English common law. So this will take time. Um, the issue of Northern Ireland, again, this is my personal opinion. Um, I believe that Northern Ireland is the, or one of the prices of leaving. Um, I think that, in fact, in the last few weeks, I believe it was announced that the demography of Northern Ireland has finally tipped in favor of a Catholic majority. Um, there is a provision for a referendum on Northern Ireland's future in the Good Friday Accords, which was signed under President Clinton's sponsorship. I think, and especially now that Sinn Féin are the government in Republic of Ireland as well, now would be the time to call that referendum. I think it's fair because the people of Northern Ireland did not vote for Brexit. They wanted to stay in. Um, they are geographically on the same piece of land as an EU state, the Republic. So it is right and fair that they be given the choice now about what their political future should be, given that the, the English and the Welsh, by voting to leave, have changed the framework. So Northern Ireland, as I understand it, will inevitably part of, be part of the price. Again, the, the road has been needlessly bumpy because of, of the use of Northern Ireland as a wedge issue by the European Union in negotiations, uh, by the use of it for domestic political reasons, uh, by the leadership of the Democratic Party here in the US. All of these things have made it more contentious than it perhaps should be. But again, in, in the medium to long term, I think that, that a sort of natural balance is reasserting itself. Um, and that includes a new set of relations between Britain and the European Union. And I sincerely hope that they can be put on a better footing and a friendlier, more constructive footing. Because, you know, the British voted to enter a trade union in the 1970s, a customs area. They didn't vote for a political union. And most peoples in Europe want a customs union without the political overlordship that comes with it. The Italians are a very good example. There's a Eurosceptic uh, government forming in Rome. That's not going to take them out of the Euro. The, the Italians joined the Euro because Brussels would offset the corruption of their political class. They want to be in Europe, but not the Europe as it currently is. And that impulse is, is a widespread one that is shared by the British and also those neighbours in the European Union. So I think in time, things will become less heated and more uh, reasonable. Um, before I ask the next question, I want to encourage our audience to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, Question about the UK and US alliance and foreign policy. Uh, one of our um, audience writes, uh, UK and US seem to have a similar foreign policy, especially when it comes to India. Is that so? But let's, let's broaden that beyond India and look at 
is there collaboration between the two governments on foreign policy and, uh, and extending to the larger alliance of the US and the UK? Where is it now? Where is it going? Robert, do, do you want to answer that one? I feel that that's, that's very much in, in your area. Um, well, it's really a question about India in a way. Um, and India is the, the ultimate pivot state in the world today. Which way will it go towards, you know, towards Russia, towards, um, towards the United States, towards China? Um, India is, um, it's, um, it, the Ukraine war has pivoted India more in the direction of the West. And partly because it, you know, the, the war has been a demonstration of the victory of Western weaponry over Russian weaponry, the performance of both weapon systems. Um, and so India wants more Western weaponry and wants to be less dependent for its burgeoning armed forces on Russian weaponry. The transition is hard to do, but that's the direction India will go. And as China becomes more aggressive, India needs to balance that, to hedge that by being a bit closer to, um, to the US. So I think Britain will follow India in this, uh, not the other way around. Because if, if the UN were to be reorganized according to 2022 realities, India would have its seat on the Security Council and Britain would, may not, you know? I think this is true. I mean, I would just add that I believe this year India has overtaken Britain in uh, GDP rankings yeah. in the world. Um, the the emergence of India as a major Asian power may yet be end up leading uh, U.S. strategy as well. I suspect. Yeah. Um, and the rapid development of U.S. Indian ties obviously is in strongly in the U.S. interest. And um, that was and a big success for George W. Bush, who um, who who began that. And, and the other thing we haven't mentioned, which is really going to dramatically affect geopolitics for the next decade, is Iran. Because if the Iranian regime were to crumble, if not now, in three or four years or sometime, it would mark a massive shift throughout the Middle East in and would also affect Russia, China, um, elsewhere. Because we, we've gotten used to this Iranian regime for, 40, you know, for over four decades, and we think it's there forever, but it isn't. And that is going to dramatically affect uh, uh, geopolitics. Yeah, and on, on on Iran, I don't think Britain can be of any use to the U.S. Uh, the the Iranians profoundly distrust Britain, going back to the Britain early. Was an occupying country. power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so can't help you there. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, another question: What about some thoughts on the Labour Party under Keir Starmer? Do we see the next government of Great Britain? Uh, what would that do or well, be? Keir Thanks. Starmer, uh, Sir Keir, in fact, he is a knight, um, not hereditary. But still, as, as a man of the party of the working people, he is a knight. Sir Keir is um, of, from the Blairite uh, social democratic wing uh, and fought the hardest battle politically he's fought, of course, in order to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn and the sort of Trotskyite revolutionary wing, which, um, I mean, we're talking about the economic challenges that Britain faces. If Corbyn had come to power in the 2019 election or the 2017 one, you know, the lights would have been out a long time ago. Um, uh, Starmer has a, a similar problem uh, to trust in the way that his solution to the problems is not to so much revive the Thatcherite recipe as revive Tony Blair's recipe. But this has been uh, proven uh, not to be sufficient. Uh, anything, it, it has grown the government and grown its budgets uh, and, and created a, a terrible crush on housing and schools and hospitals because of the sudden rise of population, particularly in southern England uh, through immigration. And, and this was not offset by a sort of trickle down wealth effect. In many ways, um, Blairism was, was an attempt to trade off that right energy against uh, a bigger welfare state. And, and the two, of course, you, you can't have both. Um, so I don't really see uh, what uh, Starmer can bring to this. You know, it, it's a, I suppose it is a crisis. It's certainly a very bad situation, but it's hard to see um, how he would help it because uh, raising taxes is not going to help either. Um, so you have to think the Labour Party, um, they haven't actually made any great suggestion of what they would do were they to come back in. 
And the way things are going, uh, they've got two years to work it out because I strongly suspect they will win the next elections. And that's stunning, given how badly the conservative government has performed in the last few weeks. You would expect the opposition to be all over the subject. Yeah, they should be setting the stall out. And and the problem is that their policies are the ones which got us to where we are now in many ways. And the irony is that these were implemented not just by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown when the Labour Party was in power. They were also implemented by David Cameron, Theresa May, and to a degree, Boris Johnson, when the Conservatives were in power. Um, this, this is part of what I meant about the uh, the, the lack of responsiveness uh, to the public's demands. What the public actually wants have not been given to them by any of the leaders of either of the major parties for a good 20 years. And, and the politician who even hints at that, as Boris Johnson did, will find themselves massively popular. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, which we partly touched on, but is there any chance Ms. Truss will revert the new tax cuts or will they compromise with Russia to save the economy? I cannot imagine that politically uh, Truss or Kwesi Karteng, the chancellor, will bring back the tax cuts that they brought in and then cancelled. Um, these, these, this upper band of tax was Gordon Brown's parting gift to the Conservatives as they came in. And uh, it was in the, in the way of a hand grenade Uh, which he had removed the pin on and then passed to them. And every Conservative leader since then has been left holding it rather tightly. And Truss attempted to free herself of this in in the name of getting the economy going. And of course, that immediately caused an outcry, uh, genuine outcry from the public, which said, why are you cutting bankers' bonuses and taxes, you know, rather cutting bankers' taxes when the rest of us are turning out the lights? And, And the media ran with it. And the media is, is very much a part of the bubble, or the London bubble, but it has turned on the Conservatives in order to cover its own posterior as things unravel. So I cannot imagine the tax cuts uh, coming back. OK, uh, another question. Is Britain still living in the bubble of its past glory? How can it improve its position internationally, perhaps through soft power? Yes, I, I think. Many people in Britain are, are quite cynical about the past glory. I mean, certainly if you, if you ask historians, they will say that the majority of British people had very little economic benefit from the captive economies of the British Empire. Uh, the people who made money out of the British Empire were that very narrow group of people who invested in those ventures. On, uh, you can uh, obviously quantify prestige as soft power. And yes, there is the hurt vanity of a power that comes down in the world and is not quite as important as it was and so on. Um, But I think most people in Britain are very much aware. I mean, hardly anybody uh, can remember the existence of a British empire. You know, if if you were uh, 10 years old when the British left India in 1947, then you'd be lucky if you remembered what you had for breakfast. So you're lucky if you're alive at all, actually. I think, I think you'll have beaten the odds. So the, I think it's easy to see, the, the, you know, because British culture is so familiar, so stylized, you know, the Queen, the Royal Family, Buckingham Palace, the flag, the Beatles, all of these things. Um, I think most people in Britain take a, a, a much uh, lighter view in a way of their past. The, most of them are very much um, more concerned about the getting and working in the present, and, and also more concerned about building a, a future because it's it's very nobody believes that uh, the past in any way can be reconstructed. Uh, so there is no choice in a way but to go forward. And when you look at how uh, the dynamism of, of the Thatcher years, you, you see that there is still an enormous popular enthusiasm uh, for making it a better place. Uh, it's certainly no impulse to sort of give up or rest. There has always been a streak of despair and defeatism amongst the the upper classes, in other words, amongst the people who benefited from the old imperial arrangement. And and a big streak of that defeatism has always run through the Foreign Service because they are drawn or were for a very long time drawn from precisely uh, that class of people. But the majority of people in Britain, I think, are are quite like their new place in the world. They they quite like the the modernity and the freedom of it. Um, With that, um, they just announced that the coronation of King Charles III will take place May 6th. Now, as I understand it, that's all pomp and circumstance. It has no 
constitutional value since he became king the second that uh, Elizabeth II died. Um, but does will does the coronation in the mix of all of this serve a purpose, or is it just like a television event? Well, you know, you mentioned India as a pivot state, and and Britain has these um, sort of joker cards that it gets to play because of the monarchy, when it's able to somehow turn itself into the pivot of global attention for a couple of days, as happened uh, with the death of Diana, as happened with the death of Elizabeth II. And given the dividend from her prestige and, and the drama of her passing, it'll happen again next May when Charles is crowned. And then the question arises, well, what use are they going to make of this moment of in the sun, this moment when everyone will be looking at London? Are they going to be just this bunch of, of ceremonial, fake medieval clowns? Or are, is Britain actually going to make some kind of statement to the world about its competence and ambition and genuine capacity to act with a certain degree of, of intelligence and flexibility as, as a modern second tier power? And, and you have to hope that someone, someone will actually think, yes, this is a good opportunity to put our best foot forward rather than the historical costume. Uh, one last question, then I'm going to turn to you. We just have a few minutes left to make some final remarks, both of you. Uh, does the UK regret not being ready for Rishi? I think quite a lot of people will. Um, I think he made very good economic arguments about the medium term interest of not just throwing the money around. Um, he lacked a sort of common touch. He was savaged by the media for it. The most fascinating thing in a way there is that the dog that did not bark, his origins were not an issue, being the son of immigrants from East Africa, being a Hindu, being non-white. None of this remotely mattered. And one of the impressive things is that the conservative leadership contest at one point was being led almost entirely by the children of immigrants. Um, the issue with Sunak that discredited him was that his wife uh, was heavily offshored for taxation. And that as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who had told uh, the British taxpayers to kind of belt up and pay their taxes as he raised them to the highest level since the 1940s, this didn't go over very well. Uh, and that is unfortunate. But as I said, the, his medium term proposals uh, made very good sense. And he is a, a highly skilled uh, financial mind. He, he will do very well in the next few years in the city of London or in New York uh, and may or hopefully return at some point because he is, he is extremely useful. But the short term appeal that Trust made, which was we're going to print more money, cut taxes and uh, make it easier in the short term, that carried the day. The membership of the Conservative Party is not composed of economists or people who work in the city of London. It's composed of people often older, often retired, who live out in the shires. And for them, the immediate cost of living issue was far more pressing than the medium term question of how are we going to pay for this down the road? So I do hope he comes back. And I suspect that like Johnson, he will. We have one minute left. Uh, Bob, Dominic, any final comments? Final thought. Uh, British Britain still has a great technological edge. The, uh, this, the, uh, the, the submarine, the nuclear submarine deal between, is between the United States and Australia requires British help. So it's like, you know, bringing NATO to the Pacific due to that U.S.-British alliance. Um, you, know, you know, so there's a lot to be said for the Anglosphere. That was an Anglosphere geopolitical event for Australia to build nuclear subs. And that's been undervalued in the news. So I think Britain still will punch above its weight. Well, I hope so. And, and, and I think you're right. These things are undervalued because they are part of the fabric. Uh, of, of the Western system and, and the way the world has worked for a very long time. I think there is an understanding at the political level and also among the voters that a certain amount of commitment is necessary to sustain that role, which carries all kinds of extra dividends for what is otherwise a small Atlantic state. So I expect uh, British politicians to continue 
to do their best to be global players, usually, of course, in concert with the US, but also with other powers, including India, Australia, so on. Um, and I don't expect that to change. I think that is, in a way, as I said, the historical gravity of the British position and, and political culture as well, uh, reasserting itself. And the question is, how are they going to set their house in order in order to achieve this? Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Bob. Great discussion. And we have to get you both back. Take care. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.